Hi, I'm Chris Hanusa, and I'm a professor at Queen's College. Today, we're going to talk about reflection groups. We're going to think of a reflection as an action of reflecting in a mirror. So, for our two-dimensional friends, that is the, basically the same thing as a flip. But in three dimensions and higher, you need to really think about that as turning everything inside out. We're going to generate all elements in a reflection group as a product of some basic reflections called generators. We'll write s sub i for the ith generator. For example, in two dimensions, if we place two one-dimensional mirrors at an angle of 60 degrees to each other, then our group consists of six elements. Well, a sequence of zero reflections corresponds to the identity element. Sequences of one reflection include flipping over the first mirror and flipping over the second mirror. Now, what about sequences of two reflections? If we flip over the same mirror twice, then we get back to where we started. So that's not a new group element, it's just the identity. So new sequences of two reflections include flipping over the first mirror and then flipping over the second mirror, or flipping over the second mirror and then flipping over the first mirror. How about sequences of three reflections? Well, we still have to alternate between our generators if we want to get new elements, so we have two possibilities, S1, S2, S1, or S2, S1, S2. But wait, I said there are only six elements. There are. S1, S2, S1 is the same as S2, S1, S2 for our six distinct elements. Now, another way to write S1, S2, S1 equals S2, S1, S2 is S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2 is equal to the identity. Or, in other words, S1, S2 cubed is equal to the identity. So, it's natural to understand reflection groups like this. A reflection group G is completely determined by its generators and by its relations. So, the, for generators, we're going to take some number of generators, S1 through SK, and for each of these generators, we'll have the relations, so SI squared is equal to the identity, and si s j to some power is equal to the identity when i is not equal to j. A simple example of a reflection group is the group of reflection symmetries of a regular polygon, which is called the dihedral group. Often we think of the group of symmetries of a polygon as all the ways to rotate the n-gon, or flip and rotate the n-gon. In particular, the dihedral group can be generated by a rotation and a reflection. Now the reflection fits right at home, but the rotation, where does that fit? So a single rotation corresponds to a sequence of two flips, as you can see right here. So the dihedral group can be understood as a reflection group where the two mirrors are placed at an angle of pi over n to each other, and that corresponds to a braid relation of s1, s2 to the nth power is equal to the identity. Another famous group is the symmetric group, which we can understand as the group of reflection symmetries of a regular simplex. So, for example, a tetrahedron. Think that in higher dimensions. Um, in fact, we've already seen the two-dimensional version, the triangle. The symmetric group S3 is the symmetry group of a triangle, where we have two mirrors placed at an angle of 60 degrees to each other. The symmetric group S4 is the group of symmetries of a tetrahedron, where now a reflection corresponds to slicing the tetrahedron by a plane and reflecting about that plane. If we label the vertices of a tetrahedron from 1 to 4 and then see what happens when we do a reflection, well the reflection slices through the tetrahedron and in changes the position of two of the vertices. And so if you think about it, what that means is what we're doing with a reflection is doing a transposition of two of the vertices. So two of the numbers on the vertices. So if we look at the group of reflections of the tetrahedron, that corresponds to the group of permutations of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, which is pretty cool. Now what's even cooler is that if we take all the different planes of symmetry of a tetrahedron and we slice the tetrahedron by these six different planes, and we chop up the tetrahedron using these planes, then what, and we explode the tetrahedron, we can see that there are exactly 24 pieces, and those correspond to the 24 permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4. As a reflection group, the symmetric group 
has generators S1 through Sn minus 1 with relations Si squared is equal to the identity. Consecutive generators satisfy Si, Si plus 1 is e cubed is equal to the identity. And non-consecutive generators commute, or in other words, Si, Sj squared is equal to the identity. Our last example is the hyperoctahedral group, or hypercubical group, which is the set of reflections of an n cube or an n octahedron. Once again, reflections correspond to slicing the polyhedron along a plane of symmetry and then turning it inside out through that mirror. Now let's explode the octahedron again. Let's slice the octahedron by all nine planes of symmetry. And once we do that, we'll explode it. And we'll see that it breaks it into 48 pieces. Why 48? Well, just as in the symmetric group case, we understood it as the permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4, we can understand the uh, symmetry group of the octahedron as the set of signed permutations of plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3. So, in general, the hyperoctahedral group uh, Cn is generated by n generators S1 through Sn, and relations of the form Si squared is equal to the identity, Si, Si plus 1 cubed is equal to the identity, except for when i is 1, in which case Si, Si plus 1 to the fourth is equal to the identity, and when you have non-consecutive generators, they commute. And that is a brief introduction to reflection groups. Thanks for watching.